Do you realize that the LA Dodgers have won more World Series in our park than our own Texas Rangers? Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. Today, uh, I'd like to feed off the cartoon I just showed you and talk about the World Series, the ending of the World Series. I know I kind of ranted last week about baseball's problem, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the World Series history, specifically the 1944 World Series, one of the uh, four World Series, including this past one, that was waged in the same ballpark. That one, of course, uh, was pretty interesting because it had two uh, non-New York teams involved or former New York teams involved. And that, of course, the Dodgers one time played in Brooklyn. The previous World Series, 21 and 22, were played in the polo grounds between the Yankees and the Giants. And, of course, this last one between the Tampa Bay Rays and the Los Angeles Dodgers. I'd like to focus on the 44 World Series uh, that was staged in Sportsman's Park. And, of course, Sportsman Park was a little bandbox looking place. Uh, I only have black and white, and I apologize to uh, my viewers out there. The ballpark, as you can see, all right, it was really fashioned or constructed between two city blocks, much like Fenway, much like Wrigley in a lot of ways. You can see that the ballpark has definite, uh, it even has a look of the polo grounds in deep center field there. And uh, both the Cardinals and the Browns, at least for 1944, played in the same place. And the reason I want to bring it up is that there are two great players. Well, one is an all-time great, Stan Musial, who was part of that 1944 World Series. And another guy by the name of Vern Stevens, who was a real uh, offensive threat as a shortstop, even at that time, he kind of stood out among his peers as being a really good offensive player. And I don't know, maybe I can somehow maybe convince people that he has probably enough elements in his career on his resume that he could qualify for the Hall of Fame. I know that the Veterans Committee uh, probably dashed his last hope. But it would be nice if people would take another look at Vern Stevens. But before I do that, I just want to talk about the poor Texas Rangers. You know, this team, in a lot of ways, is snake bit. They played probably in two of the most exciting World Series in the 21st century, losing to the Giants and then losing to the Cardinals, no less. And in both they had leads in both. They surrendered the leads in both. They went home um, without the trophy, the World Series trophy. And uh, it really, really, I I'm not making fun of the Texas Rangers. It's just that sometimes you just feel like some franchises are snake bit. And I'm starting to wonder if the Texas Rangers are one of those ball clubs and that you may not see them again. Uh, in the World Series, and they may just take on the same kind of, of feeling that you get when you think about the Cleveland Indians or the Red Sox before they won or the Chicago Cubs or the White Sox. You know, here's the deal. People don't realize this, but the Texas Rangers began as the new Washington Senators after the old Washington Senators, and this is why I think they're snake bit, after the old Washington Senators decided, and Clark Griffin made this decision, that out in Minnesota, out in the hinterlands of Minnesota, they could build a winner. And of course, he moves his club from the East Coast, from our nation's capital, out to Bloomington, actually Minneapolis, St. Paul, but to make both sides kind of happy, he goes to a neutral site and goes to Bloomington and builds a municipal stadium where both the Vikings, which also have had their hardships, another snake bit uh, franchise in a lot of ways, uh, where they both uh, played for, for many years. Here's the deal. They no sooner go out there with a young Harmon Killebrew 
from that senator, the old Washington senators, and they win the 65 pennant and then play a great World Series before losing to Sandy Koufax in the uh, in the seventh game two nothing. And we've talked about that as well, you know, with uh, when we were, we had mentioned about uh, Whitey Ford. I had talked about how he won like four straight and he was involved in six straight shutouts in the World Series. And then, of course, his last series, 1963, he suffered two losses at the hands of pitching great Sandy Koufax. It's not a knock against Whitey Ford as much as just showing you what a great pitcher Koufax was. And that uh, and again, he wins two games, I believe, in the 65 World Series. Remember, that was an, also an interesting series because in 65, he wins the game seven on two days rest. And uh, he took time for religious observance for uh, one of the Jewish holidays during the World Series and uh, was obviously granted it and and comes back and wins, helps the Dodgers win that World Series in Minnesota. So, uh, of course, Koufax pitches one more year. And interestingly enough, they get swept by the Baltimore Orioles in four games. And, of course, uh, Koufax retires from the game as one of the greatest, if not arguably the greatest left-handed pitcher and probably, well, greatest left-handed. Well, I got to really think about that because you do have Warren Spahn and a number of others. But listen, that's the fun thing of arguing and debating all this. He, without a doubt was a player in the 1960s. He was right up there with the Willie Mazes and Hank Aarons, uh, a handful of and Bob Gibsons in the National League who had a real hold on the National League that as Koufax went, so did the Dodgers. As Mays went, so did the Giants, etc. So he was one of those elite players of all time. The argument is, where is he in the upper, uh, in, in terms of, he's definitely in the upper le- echelon pitcher in terms of hall of fame where does he rank though that is the fun part of it anyway digressing again remember this is a show where if we're talking in a pub after a game and we're having a burger and a beer everything that strikes me comes into play just as if you were having a normal conversation so i apologize if i go off on a tangent but it's all having to do somehow with baseball and the World Series in this episode. Anyway, in 1944, you have the the St. Louis Cardinals and, of course, the St. Louis Browns. It's the only pennant for the St. Louis Browns. And like the Washington Senators uh, and slash Texas Rangers, the Browns were also a snake bit franchise. Never before had they gotten to the World Series, let alone win a title. So they do have the pennant. And ironically enough, they have to play their rivals in the same city, the St. Louis Cardinals. And I just want to focus on this. The series goes six. Really, the Cardinals, uh, not so much manhandle, but the Cardinals have a number of players on that team. Uh, let me just see if I can find it real quick here. Uh, the Cardinals in 1944 have, of course, the great Stan Musial. They have Walker Cooper as their catcher. They have Marty Marion as their shortstop. Imagine that. You have Stevens and Marty Marion as your shortstops. Very similar to how baseball had a couple of years ago uh, with Jeter and Rodriguez and the Boston great No More Garcia Power, all coming up at the same time. Uh, three really heavy-duty shortstops. And, of course, it's becoming the position of emphasis right now, too, with Korea of, of the Astros, okay, and several others. Anyway, I'm digressing. Anyway, you had Marty Marion and Stan Musial, along with Walker Cooper as a catcher. Cooper, of course, had 13 and 72. He had a batting average of 317. I'll, I'll get to him in a second. Walker Cooper, I bring up because his brother, Mort Cooper, was 22 and 7 on that team. And Max Lanier was 17 and 12, along with Harry the Cat Breachin, who was 16 and 5. And I think Breachin, two years later, wins, I think, three games in the 46 World Series. Okay. And then they had a guy named Ted Wilkes, 17 and 4. 
the Cardinals were loaded with great pitching that year, but Cooper had 22 wins. He had a 2.46 ERA, and he had 22 complete games with seven shutouts and a save. So they come into that series loaded for bear. Uh, I, I you know, oh, also the, an outfielder for that team. Even though he was age forty, I didn't realize this was a guy by the name of Pepper Morton, and of course he was with the Gas House Gang. But Pepper Morton, age forty, two homers, four RBIs, two seventy nine batting average, played in forty games that year. Obviously came in for defense or just to spell some people and all the rest of it. Stan Musial, ready for this, age 23, 12 homers, 94 RBIs, and he hit 347 at the age of 23. What people don't realize, though, 51 doubles that year and 14 triples with 112 runs scored. And no, he didn't lead the league in any of those. I thought for sure he would lead in triples. He didn't. And 51 doubles. You know, Musial was just a great, great player. And I know that my mother-in-law was a huge Brooklyn Dodger fan. She always talks to, uh, tells me how much the Dodger fans <laughs> is probably more beloved than many of their own Dodger players, with the exception of maybe Hodges and Robinson. And there was rumors at the time where, can you imagine if uh, they had gone through with the trade of Musial going to the Dodgers? There's no question that had Musial played with those great 50s Dodgers team, that the Dodgers probably would have won a couple of more World Series, without a doubt. Just having his bat and just his charisma, his leadership, everything. I, I can't really say enough about Musial. Just a real gentleman of the game. And uh, I always thought this when I was a kid. If... Ted Williams, and I'll talk about him in a couple of seconds, was seen as maybe the John Wayne of baseball. I always thought that Stan Musial was kind of like the Jimmy Stewart of baseball. Um, and I, I think enough is, is said on that. You know, just my little personal type of things. It, just in many respects, that's how I, I just saw both players. And that's how I saw both actors. And how kind of those two worlds kind of paralleled each other. Anyway, that World Series was played in Sportsman Park. I just want to run down some of the guys in, in that thing. Um, Marty Marion, six homers, 63 RBIs, hit 267. Now, Marion, of course, is uh, an MVP. He's a three-time World Series winner. He is a uh, three-time All-Star. Uh, he is seen as... Uh, just a really good shortstop. Uh, he actually led the league in doubles, and he does win the MVP in 1944 for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. And probably the reason why he wins that is because he's playing shortstop, and, of course, Mutual is playing one of the outfield positions. And uh, uh, I think Mutual played right field, if, if I recall. But just think about that. In 1944, Vern Stevens, okay, for the St. Louis uh, Browns. He's 20, 109, hit 293, far superior numbers, plus 91 runs scored. He played 145 games. And you know where he came up in the MVP? He was number three. The MVP that year was Hal Neuhauser of the Detroit Tigers. And of course, Neuhauser wins two MVPs. The thing about and I guess I'm maybe I'm going to stage the next couple of minutes as being on a, a, a soapbox for Vern Stevens, and I wish people would think more about it. Stevens made the All Star team one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times. His last one being at the age of thirty with the Boston Red Sox. Stevens leads the league in RBIs not once, not twice, but three times. And in fact, in 1949 and 1950. He had 159 and 144 RBIs, respectively. Plus, he's one of the few shortstops to lead the league in home runs. All right, albeit it was 1945. I think he tied Nick Etten of the uh, New York Yankees with 24. Regardless, 24 homers, 89 RBIs. He hit 289. He hit 
uh, over 290, one, two, three, four, five, six, six times in his career, um, in his full-time career, winds up with a lifetime 286 batting average with 1,800 uh, hits, 1,859 to be exact. But here's the big deal with him. And this is why I really think that baseball writers ought to start thinking about this. True, his war is only a 46, but we've already documented how many uh, Hall of Famers have uh, a war that's even less than that. And real good players have a war under 46. And I, I can go through the litany. I just don't want to go back and forth with the thing. I'd rather stay on this. He was an MVP choice or he finished in the top 10 five times and he was an mvp candidate every year from 1942 to 1950 so that's nine seasons now understandably i know there might be quote unquote guys with better numbers but for nine years there Vern stevens was a player probably got what hurt him was this. The Browns stunk after 44. I get it. He gets traded at the age of 29 or 28. So people will right away say, oh, he's going into his lower stages. He has about four good years with, with the Red Sox. Actually, well, four. He actually has two really outstanding years for the Red Sox. And then at the age of 30, even though he makes the all-star team, and even though any shortstop today would 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 die for these numbers. It is almost his stats are halved from the year before. In 1950, for instance, he goes 30 and 144 and hits hits 295. The following year in 51, he has 17 homers, 78 RBIs. He does hit slightly higher, 300. But then by 52, basically his career just goes down. I think what hurts him, of course, is the fact that Again, he's one of those players that has those five, six great seasons and then just falls off the cliff. And he doesn't really end his career with, all right, maybe I can get 70. Like if he had, let's say, average 70 RBIs for the next three, four years. And so at age 35, you could still pencil in that he was going to give you a 15 and 75 and maybe a 280 batting average. Perhaps the committee. And perhaps the Hall of Fame voters would have said, hey, you know, he had a really outstanding career. He was just really supercharged, though, for those. Put it this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He had six years where he had 90 or more RBIs. He had four seasons where he had over 100. This is a shortstop. It's not an outfielder. If these were outfield numbers or a first baseman, yeah, I, I could maybe understand, but I really think that perhaps the uh, some sort of committee should really uh, reinvestigate his numbers. I know he died prematurely, uh, apparently had a heart attack, so he was never really able to make a case this way in terms of marketing or, or coming back for, uh, let's say, uh, Hall of Fame Day or, excuse me, Old Timers Day. Etc. But Vern Stevens also led the league in games played 155 and 48 and 49. He was a solid ball player. I would say, yeah, maybe he's not uh, upper echelon Hall of Fame when we talk about the Mazes and the Koufax, the Gibsons and the Seavers, but he's right there as a B plus player, kind of like, I don't know, a Lou Brock or, uh, you know, I don't know, a Ron Santo or a Billy Williams type of great player. And I know there's going to be arguments. I'm just pointing out that we never think of Billy Williams in the same echelon as the Aaron and the Mazes. But this guy was a solid player. Today, I mean, he's got the same numbers as uh, I want to see a, a Korea uh, put these numbers up of 39, 159, and 290. And he's a brilliant shortstop for the Astros. And I'm not picking on him. I'm just saying, let's see him put these numbers up. Because this guy did it for a number of years. Not only that, he hit over 20 home runs six years. And in two of those, he had 30 home runs. Now, you can say all you want. Well, he played in Fenway and all the rest of it. But 
the S um, the Astrodome. Uh, Minute Maid Park is a hitter's ballpark. All right. Yankee Stadium was a left-hander's delight. Look at Ruth, Mantle, and Garrick. So it's not his fault that he was playing in a hitter's ballpark. He took advantage of it. Uh, he scored over 100 runs three times, over 90 runs five times. So you're talking about a very good ball player. And for the life of me, I don't know why he's been excluded from the Hall of Fame. I think about some of the guys that got in. You're like, Oof. Speaking of which, contemporary, well, last 30 years, you're thinking of a guy like Daryl Evans who embodies 21st century baseball, walks, home runs, and high on base percentage. You want to take a look at him. What hurts him, I'm glad that he won the World Series in 84 for the Tigers. Probably what hurts him, he had so many teams that he played for. And I think what also helps ball players is the fact that they become a kind of a focus on one particular team. Now for Stevens, maybe you could make the argument had he played his whole career with St. Louis, or maybe he played his whole career with Boston, that might have helped him a little bit. But I really think, and uh, you know, 46 war, and I'm not even thinking about the war, as I told you, uh, the war is kind of Odd, uh, sometimes in its formula. Uh, sometimes you just don't get it. But he's a guy, lifetime 286 average. But more importantly, this, I think a guy who's being mentioned in the MVP each year for nine consecutive years must be doing something right on the ball field to be mentioned that way. And don't forget, outside of 44, the Browns stunk. And yet in 43 and in 42, he is being considered. Now, people might also say this. Well, those are the war years. <laughs> many of the Browns in 44, I was reading about this, many of the Browns in the 44 team, they were so good because many of them were uh, <laughs> failed their physical for the U.S. Army. Kind of weird, right? But uh, they, they they flunked admission into the Army. And of course, they, they went back to baseball <laughs> and they were the best baseball players at the time in the American League. And that is one of the reasons why they won in 44. Just amazing how how, how things are, are so wild that way. Anyway, uh, that World Series was played, like I said, in Sportsman Park. It went to uh, the Cardinals. Cardinals actually lost the first two games in that World Series and then rebound to win three straight. No, excuse me. Browns won the first game. And then it went, Cardinals went back and forth, back and forth. Actually, the Cardinals had a three games to one lead or a three games to two lead. And then, uh, defeat the St. Louis Browns. You know, it's funny. I'm going back and forth and it was just like this year's. I'm looking at St. Louis and automatically thinking, okay, that's the Cardinals. They're the home team. But, uh, you have to know that both teams, so they, they switched. You know, home and away, home and away. So I apologize. It kind of confused me. Cardinals lost the first game, and then they actually won the last three. All right. So the Browns actually had a two games to one lead. The attendance for that never exceeded thirty six or thirty seven thousand. They got thirty three, thirty five, thirty four, thirty five, thirty six, thirty one, and I believe that most people could get there via subway or a trolley car. So um, kind of an interesting, oh, I'll tell you what. One other thing. Uh, one of the best managers, and he's another guy who I thought never got his due as a manager, and that is the, the fellow by the name of Billy Southworth. Uh, don't understand why, because he was a heck of a manager. I'm just looking. Now, uh, played for several teams, played for the Cardinals, and he also managed the St. Louis Cardinals and the Boston Braves. And he managed the Cardinals in 42. Uh, actually, he won uh, three World Series with the Cardinals in four, uh, 1926, 
1942 and 1944. Well, one as a player, but he won two. He won two World Series for the Cardinals in 42 and 44. He is in the St. Louis Hall of Fame, but it took him a while to get inducted in, into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And the reason why I, I was always big on him was that uh, he won wherever he was. He had a 6.42 winning percentage as manager of the Cardinals. And then he goes to uh, uh, manage the Braves. I know he had a lot of tragedy in his life, uh, and uh, but he, he actually helped make that Braves team, uh, 46 through 48 and 49. He was the manager of the Braves team with Spahn and Sane. So he won that pennant and probably helped right the ship for the Boston Braves. Because they move and go to Milwaukee where they win two more pennants. Southworth was, by all that I can see, was an excellent manager. Just another guy that, you know, we, we probably overlooked in terms of baseball history. And uh, maybe probably because he didn't have uh, uh, a magnetic personality or uh, he had other things going on that, you know, maybe the press just didn't gravitate to him the same way that they did. I don't know, Casey Stengel and all the rest of it. But Southworth was a Hall of Fame manager. Of course, you have Rogers Horn, uh, Rogers Horn. You have Stan Musial, future Hall of Famer. And of course, my guy, Vern Stevens, who I wish that someone would take a look again and say, you know what, maybe this guy, yeah, maybe we could consider him for the world, uh, for the Hall of Fame. One other thing before I'd like to go, and that is just talk a little bit about the old Texas Rangers. I Oh, absolutely, I have one other thing. I do have, and I apologize to my uh, viewers out there. These are in black and white. Uh, but before I, I do that, these are, <laughs> I, I think baseball car collectors will get a kick out of both of these. But this, I believe, is a 1957 baseball card of Stan Musial. And I just love it. Now, you have to understand that's color in the back. This is Sport Magazine, 1958, All-Star Selection, Stan Musial. Remember, he retires in 63 from the game, so he's got another six seasons basically in him. Great smile. He just looks like a ball player, doesn't he? Really does look like a ball player. That's why he's called the man. And, of course, these are great cards. If you grew up probably in the 50s collecting baseball cards, and, of course, I saw this as well. I, these cards are expensive probably to purchase today, especially if you get them in mint condition. But these cards, with the advent of TV becoming more of a staple in families, uh, American families' homes, Tops decided that they would show baseball cards or baseball players inside uh, televisions. And, of course, there's a baseball book out there that really, really uh, articulates the humor behind this. Uh, the grainy wood down here, as they would say. Look at the picture in the back. And, of course, this is black and white. This really has to be appreciated in color. And maybe when I... I finally figure out and get some new uh, tone for the printer. I'll show this in future episodes in, in color. But this is Vern Stevens. This is he when he was with the Boston Red Sox. So this is, you know, the early 50s. And uh, just a good, really good ball player, Vern Stevens. And I think I showed you sports in park one more time. I want to show you. This is Sports and Park, site of the 44 World Series. Really a, a cool-looking ballpark when you think about it. In many respects, if you've been to Camden Yards or you've been to the other new retro parks, you can, you can sense that the architects probably had these type of uh, stadiums in mind when they were making them. Uh, the Camden Yards and all the others. Uh, Want to get into the new 
Washington Senators be called before they become the Texas Rangers. People don't realize that uh, they come into being in 61, as I said. Uh, the old Washington Senators become the Minnesota Twins, and they have one of those great logos that I always love. They play in Bloomington. But uh, the legacy of the Washington Senators, Washington was left without a ball club. Interestingly enough, those same uh, St. Louis Browns do eventually move from St. Louis to become the Baltimore Orioles. And there is a story. I don't know how much truth it was uh, it is to it, but apparently I believe that Brooks Robinson came up in the form system of the St. Louis Browns. And at one point, St. Louis was about to trade, let's say, a, their complete team, like eight, nine players, to Kansas City for their complete uh, starting team. And then it was put on hold because the Boston, uh, the St. Louis Browns apparently didn't want to part with Brooks Robinson. And, of course, how would baseball have changed then? Had Brooks eventually go to the Athletics, who eventually moved to Oakland, and then, you know, they are three-time World Series champions in the early 70s. Meanwhile, Baltimore would only have one of the Robinsons, and you wonder what they would have done to fill third base. Just interesting. I don't know how true it is. I've read or heard it once before. Uh, I, I figure I'd just throw it out there because that was uh, one of those old stories I, I grew up with, and it's always the what if. But anyway, St. Louis Browns move to Baltimore. In the 50s, and of course, you talk about a snake bit franchise. No sooner do they move out of uh, St. Louis that the Orioles start their winning ways, or the Browns start their winning ways as the Baltimore Orioles. And of course, they bring up some good young uh, talent in terms of their pitching staff. They acclimate, you know, they uh, add, of course, to that the great Frank Robinson, who Brooks has always said probably brought the winning attitude with him. And he was the reason. Brooks was a quiet uh, leader, and Frank was more of a stern leader, kind of like a general. And uh, they meshed, and the Orioles did quite well. 66, and of course, 70, they win the World Series. They get to two other ones. Um, but it's interesting that the Browns were snake bit at one point. Then they go to Baltimore, and of course, they become the Orioles. Uh, number of 100-game seasons and all the rest of it. But I just want to tell you this. The Senators start out, they're terrible. They do hire, and we talked about this with the 62 Mets, they did hire uh, Gil Hodges to be their manager uh, about 62, maybe about 64. Uh, he kind of gets them in a winning way. And then, of course, he is actually dealt. Uh, I don't know whether I, I brought that up in a preview. He's actually traded to the Mets to become their manager. And the Mets, of course, trade. Uh, of course, I can't remember the pitcher, but he's on the rookie card with Tom Seaver. And he goes to the Senators as uh, uh, compensation. And anyway, Gill leaves. They get a couple of uh, managers in there. And then in 69, I believe it's Bob Short, who is the new owner. Short hires a guy by the name of Ted Williams. And the reason why I want to show this is because I always loved this. Uh, and I did have this 70 baseball card of Ted Williams. As I mentioned, he always reminded me uh, of the John Wayne of baseball. Just a fascinating, fascinating uh, person and not just baseball history. I really believe in American history. He's up there. You have to consider him as a top 100, almost like a uh, American history person. And certainly at least of the 20th century, not just for what he did on the field, but off it as a Marine pilot, etc. And what he did for the game of baseball, of course, the last man to hit 400, he did it at the age of 23. I mentioned that before with uh, Stan Musial. Uh, Williams, though, had uh, a guy by the name, and he's still one of my favorite. I don't know. Everyone laughs when I say this. I just love this guy. Uh, Frank Howard. I don't know why uh, people give me all kinds of 
of laughter when I say he's one of my favorite players of all time. Uh, he was had one of the most fitting nicknames in all of baseball during the 70s. He was called the Capital Punisher. And the interesting thing, and I know this is a 1970 baseball card. I don't know whether I had this one, but I used to love the logo uh, of baseball for their 100th anniversary, and they had that patch sewn on the 69 season. I wish they would still go back to that because now when you think about it, they could have had it two years ago to celebrate baseball's 150th. But, of course, baseball sometimes just doesn't get marketing in a lot of ways. Love the logo. Obviously, fans of today recognize the Washington logo because they borrow that, the Nationals, from the Senators. Interesting thing about uh, Frank Howard. Now, he would definitely be a DH today. As it is, he hit 382 home runs. He did win Rookie of the Year for the Dodgers. He does win a World Series with the Dodgers in 63. He was part of that uh, sweep uh, by the Dodgers of the Yankees in 63. But people don't realize it. He gets to uh, the Senators. And if you take a look at uh, his two years, or maybe three years under uh, Ted Williams as his manager, Man, put it this way. Again, the big if. Had Frank Howard played earlier in his career for Ted Williams or had Ted Williams been part of his career a little bit more than three seasons, you might be talking about a guy who would have had maybe 570 home runs, not 382. You probably would have been talking about a guy, instead of hitting 279 or 275 lifetime, probably at 290 to 300, all right? He probably would have been moved permanently to first base, not playing the outfield, um, just to make better use. And, of course, by 72, that was the late stage of his career. He becomes a DH with the Tigers. But you would have been talking about a different ball player. You would have been talking about a guy. Uh, he led the league in home runs twice. With the Senators, he was a beast in uh, 69, 68, and 70. In 70, he had 44 home runs, I think, or 44 or 48. I know that uh, he hit either 44 and 48 and 69 and 70, but he just had a monster year. And there was one period there, I think, where he had 10 home runs in about six games or six days, just mashed the ball. He was scary. You know, everyone talks about Judge being so big and stuff. Well, at the time, but there are more kind of players like Judge today, like, you know, 6'4". Six, six, I mean, the Yankees have like three of them on their team. This guy at 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and he's about 250, 260 pounds. Most players when they were coming up, here it was. Here's the lineup, lineup. And then it was Frank Howard. Then it was like this. He really did. Uh put the fear of God <laughs> uh, into a pitcher's uh, in, into a pitcher's heart every time he came up. Uh, he does move. People don't realize this, but the Rangers become the Rangers at the end of the 1970 season. They're not drawing at, in Washington. They have terrible teams. Actually, in 69, Williams does get them to, to have their best record probably in the New Washington Center's career. They go 86 and 76. He, I think he's even named manager of the year. They still finish 25 games behind the Orioles. That's not a knock against the Senators as much as you're saying, oh, my God, how good were the Orioles? But um, Williams, I think, wins the manager of the year. Uh, he doesn't last too long. There was some stories where the players felt that Williams was just too centered on uh, giving hitting tips instead of managing the baseball team. All right. Regardless, he does win that. He does win 86 games in 69. By 70, though, the team never really drew all that well. Uh, they decide that they're going to move to Texas and become the Texas Rangers uh, for the 71, or excuse me, for the 72 season. Pardon me, for the 72 season. At the end of the 71 season, all right, 
they play their final home game against the Yankees. And there's like a big riot at RFK stadium. People are like ripping apart the seats to take them home. They're throwing stuff on the field. Uh, I think the centers actually had to forfeit the last game, game 162 to the Yankees, even though they were winning because the fans were just going crazy. And then to start the 72 season, that's it. I apologize. Um, uh, they become the Texas Rangers. Uh, the reason I made that mistake is because I remember having a Sports Illustrated baseball game, and uh, they have not the 71 Washington Senators. They had already made the beautiful uh, step of just calling them or anointing them the Texas Rangers on their baseball charts. But uh, Frank Howard actually started a couple of All-Star games for the, uh, for the Senators. Started the 69, and I believe he started the 70 or 71. And uh, so they go to Texas, and the funny thing is, he is, I think they win 54 games in 71, and of course, Ted Williams is really chased out of there, uh, and they hire. Now, here's the crazy thing, and this is where I'll end this. The Texas Rangers hired a litany of managers. At one point, I believe in 74, they actually had three managers in one day. I think they had a guy named Connie Ryan, they had Nellie Fox, and he had another guy named Frank Lucchese. And they finally get a guy in there. Oh, they also had Whitey Herzog. And this is the interesting thing. None of them could win with the team. And, of course, if you're a Yankee fan and you're particularly this guy, they bring in Billy Martin. And in 1974, he gets the Rangers to win 88 games. He manages an MVP in Jeff Burroughs, who never has the same season again. And take a look at some of his coaches. Frank Lucchese, who gets his jaw broken. Art Fowler, by a player. And uh, Art Fowler, who was his longtime pitching coach. Charlie Silvera, who I know as a backup catcher to Yogi Berra and plays on a number of World Series teams. And Jackie Moore, who I believe was a pitcher for the old Rangers. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. I want to thank you again for allowing me into your homes. And a special shout out to Howard Fredericks, who produces the show and helps me out a lot. Until next week, thanks, and I'll see you soon.